May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. On the 13th of October in 1269, just there where our altar now stands, two coffins lay side by side on the high altar of Westminster Abbey. Both coffins were for the same man. Now we've heard this story several times in the last couple of days and the canon theologian will be setting a test next week to see if you have it straight. You can laugh, the test is in Latin. <laughs> One coffin on the altar had contained the body of Edward the Confessor. Uh, and since the 13th of October 1163, that coffin had held that body because Edward the Confessor, newly made a saint, had been removed from his grave and put in a shrine. That is the feast of the translation of Edward the Confessor. On the 13th of October 1269, so a hundred years later, he was now being given a new coffin. And that coffin was then carried on the shoulder of princes into an equally magnificent new shrine, the shrine that's just behind that screen. And not just a new shrine, but in 1269, this was a brand new church. So that means that 13th of October, the Feast of the Translation of Edward the Confessor, also becomes the Feast of our Dedication. It's the day we inhabit this particular church built by Henry III. In Westminster Abbey, never let it be said that we let a celebration go to waste. So on the 13th of October, we keep the Feast of Translation, and today we keep the Feast of Dedication. In Latin, dedicare, to devote to consecrate. So today we are a devoted people in a dedicated building. Now, devoted to what? What does it mean to be dedicated? Well, the answer's actually a bit restless. In 1269, this abbey wasn't actually finished. It was a project, and the project was Edward the Confessor. Henry III built this church because he wanted Edward the Confessor to have a new shrine. He was devoted to the confessor. He wanted us to be devoted as well. But it was all a bit curious. Devotees are usually people who are very careful about the precious memory. They want to keep it safe, look after it. Devotion is usually something that's fairly conservative. Let's just suppose that back in the 1970s, I was devoted to the music of my youth. So let us imagine that I was a fan of the Bee Gees. What would I have done? Well, I would have collected their records. I might have had a scrapbook. I would have had pictures on my wall. I would have had mementos, and I would have kept them safe. I would have held the Bee Gees very close. Just before we start spreading rumours, can we be clear that in my teens I read books and briefly collected fossils? There was not a Bee Gee in sight. <laughs> I'm just trying to remind you that devotees are usually people who hold things close and keep them safe. Not Henry III. He was devoted to Edward Confessor. Edward the Confessor, who had built the great church, the Abbey, in Westminster. By the reign of Henry III, this was the last pre-conquest building, major religious building in this country. And Henry III, devoted to the memory of Edward the Confessor, knocked his building down. Tore it right down from one end to the other. A sustained act of demolition. And he did that out of devotion. Because he wanted to, he wanted to tell us a story. He wanted to see and hear something that he had to say. We should notice, first of all, that he did that here in Westminster. He didn't do it in Winchester. He didn't do it in Wendover. He did it here, beside the Royal Palace, by the Exchequer, by the Court of Common Pleas, right by Parliament, right by a Parliament that was just learning to flex its muscles. So Henry III was saying something about power and something about community. It was a lesson in having faith and being a nation. And that's something of the devotion that we've inherited here. 
It's the dedication you explore just ahead of a coronation. How do you think about faith? How do you do it together? How do you do it as a nation? Henry III always wanted us to think big. The Abbey was built big, and it's full of images and ideas. There are prompts and clues all around us, lessons in how to join in. The Abbey actually can fairly easily be misunderstood. We tend to see it as old and stately and venerable, the sort of thing that you need to look after, you know, that devotion that holds things and keeps them safe. But that's not what Henry intended. He thought this building should be poking you in the ribs, tugging at your sleeve. Look, listen, pay attention. The things that prompt us in this building, the things that jostle for our attention and argue with us, are actually pretty well all of them carved in stone. One or two of them are painted. Even so, they can be pretty energetic. All religious buildings do this to us. All of them are trying to tell us things. I don't know if you've been there, but at Reims Cathedral, if you visit, you will pass a smiling angel as you walk in at the Great West Door, and you are supposed to notice that an angel is smiling at you. It's there to get you thinking. The poet, Olga Sedekova, imagines it speaking to us as we walk by. Ready? The angel asks, smiling. I'm asking, though I know quite well you're ready, sure to be. You see, it's not just anyone I'm talking to you. It's to you. To you. Tugging at your sleeve, poking you in the ribs, asking you, are you ready? There is no smiling angel, I'm afraid, at the door in Westminster Abbey. But Henry III did give us something he wanted us to notice. 750 years after he gave it to us, it's just a little weary, but it's still here, asking us if we're ready. And it's high up there on the wall, just beneath that great big rose window. Don't get a crick in your necks, you'll be better looking at it a bit later. You can still see, looking up uh, at that, uh, at the rose window, and in the two corners, there are two angels, and they have sensors the sensor is right out in front of them, and they're right in the corner just under the window. Between them, and very badly damaged, are two figures. On the left is Edward the Confessor. The other is an old poor pilgrim with his arms stretched out. It's a bit of storytelling. It's a story about how Edward the Confessor once gave a ring to a pilgrim who was begging for arms, and years later, two English pilgrims in Jerusalem met an old man who asked them to get, take a message to their king, to Edward. I'm John, he said, the apostle, the evangelist, and I love the holy king Edward, and I know him to be near to God. And he gave them the ring, which Edward, all unknowing, had once given to him, and promised that Edward would one day share in the joy of heaven. And they've been up there for 750 years, Edward the Confessor, and a pilgrim who's actually St. John the Evangelist. And that is what you would have seen when you stepped into this abbey, because that is the door you would have come in at, the door nearest Henry III's palace, right ahead of you. A story, an invitation to think about a holy king who entered heaven because he knew how to live a holy life and knew that any moment he might meet God and one of God's people. Up there forever, a king and a pilgrim exchanging gifts, a king and a beggar making a community where no community has a right to be. And that's the devotion of the Abbey Church. Power living in holiness, faith in national life. The community we could be, not the community we are. This Abbey was built when this nation was at war with itself, Henry III was fighting for survival. The Abbey was a bit of propaganda. Some of that propaganda suited the king very well indeed, but the point is still good. The walls in this building are telling us a story, clamoring for our attention and begging us to be a different kind of people, a dedicated people. Just now, as 750 years 
ago, there, were, there are so many distractions for us. So many distractions at the moment in our national la life. Power is so very complicated just now, and not above pushing its own propaganda. Yet always, always, Westminster Abbey, the house of kings and queens, the place of coronation, holy ground, invites us to live in holiness invites us to imagine what it is like to live with the saints and be a different kind of community, the place where the kingdom of God is always breaking in, a community where gifts are exchanged and holiness turns into glory. That poem by Olga Sedakova, the one about the angel at Reims, begins with the smiling angel asking us if, if we're ready and tells us the angel will go on asking us, You'll hear me asking again and again and again, as every evening the bells conjure my name. That angel at Reims is in fact very badly damaged, just like our statues. It was blown up in World War I. So this angel can speak of terrible things, sad stories. It can ask us if we're ready for plague, famine, earthquake, fire, foreign invasions, surges of aggression, well, yes, all that's important, obviously, but it's not what I'm asking about, not what I'm under orders to remind you of, not what they sent me for. What I'm saying is, are you ready for more joy than you'd believe? The angel is a summons and an invitation, and so is Westminster Abbey. It isn't here to preserve itself, and our dedication is not to be careful and cautious because religion is fragile and has to be looked after and protected. We are not in Westminster Abbey because we're frightened that the world might infect us and spoil everything. Our dedication is to learn the summons of God and share it with our battered, compromised world stewing in the worst kind of propaganda. We are consecrated to proclaim the hope that we can be the people we are meant to be, the community of a nation that lives with possibility, inhabiting a shared faith. We are here to be entirely dedicated to the absurd possibility of more joy than you'd believe. Amen.